Hi there. Uh, hi everyone. My name is Pat Bonney. I'm a social researcher at Federation University, um, based in Lake Tyres, East Gippsland, on Gunai Kurnai country. And to begin, I acknowledge the Gunai Kurnai as the traditional owners of this catchment and its waters, uh, as well as the Lake Tyres Aboriginal Trust uh, as the holders of land rights for the, for the Lake Tyres Reserve. Uh, together, uh, I acknowledge their deep connection and custodianship of these lands and waters um, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Now back in 2016, uh, I entered the citizen science world as a, as a freshwater scientist. And like many of you watching today, I was drawn to this idea that communities were utilizing the scientific method to understand their local waterways. Much like this group here, uh, Japarit Water Watch, who are, who are incidentally uh, worth celebrating uh, as they've been collecting water quality data along the uh, Wimmera River uh, for over 25 years and haven't missed a month. So when I began my PhD with this background in freshwater science, I was naturally uh, drawn to understanding how these different, how these data sets collected by groups like Japarit Water Watch were being used to make a, a positive difference for science, for environments and for communities. However, spending many months uh, reading and speaking with people on the ground, it was hard to find many examples where citizen science data was being used in decision making. And this was sort of the first major realization I had during my PhD. Um, the second realization was um, what this presentation is about, uh, that in order to connect citizen science with decision making, we need to think beyond science and beyond data to instead examine how people and organizations uh, are working together in decision making contexts or what I'm calling here a relational perspective. So I'll first provide an overview today of why linking citizen science uh, with government decision making is important. Um, I'll then highlight how a relational model might help us better understand uh, this issue uh, using a comparative case study approach of two water watch programs in Victoria and the ACT, where I interviewed a range of different stakeholders uh, to highlight not only how pro these programs have been faced with historic marginalization from decision making, but also, and more importantly, the range of different social practices and strategies that they've used to maximize their usefulness and legitimacy in the management of freshwater environments. So citizen science can uh, affect uh, environmental decision making through two pathways, through both scientific information, um, as well as fostering the engagement of the public in decision making processes. Um, although this secondary pathway is really interesting, um, I'm very interested in that aspect to, to citizen science. Uh, in today's presentation, I'm just going to be focusing on this first pathway of inquiring, acquiring science. So the uptake of citizen science data uh, is important, uh, I think, because it is an indicative of the acceptance of the practice as a legitimate form of environmental knowledge that can help us address uh, the social and environmental challenges we face. However, as I mentioned, um, it's been difficult to find successful examples, particularly in the case studies that I was uh, working in. So in the citizen science literature, to address this issue, we often find studies trying to understand the accuracy of volunteer data, uh, to develop new technologies to support data access and management, but also how well they can, what the uh, citizen science data compares with professional approaches. So taking this scientific and technical framing, but I think this is only part of the story. Uh, this literature has tended to neglect that environmental decision making um, is really a complex social process and that the barriers to data uptake are as much a social issue as they are a scientific or technical one. So to provide some background to this idea, uh, I'm gonna to touch on some social theory, which I, I do hope you find interesting. Uh, and let me know if you do in the, in the, in the chat. Um, it relates to the different models around linking knowledge with action, um, in action being some kind of policy making or on ground environmental management decision. And so we have this classic linear model on the left where scientific information is produced, uh, such as citizen science data, and it's then transferred into the policy making arena where decisions are made. Uh, but this linear model has been critiqued, heavily critiqued uh, over the recent uh, decades in particular because it's failed to consider the um, social context of environmental decision making. That is, it presumes decision making is done on a technical basis alone and that scientific information is all but waiting to be used and taken up by policymakers. Alternatively, uh, a relational model uh, highlights that the boundaries between, uh, two, between knowledge domains are more, cha uh, more changeable and contestable and permeable and they're negotiated through social interactions. 
And this negotiation is otherwise known as boundary work, which can help us describe the different social processes that are, in, that are involved in creating, maintaining, or, or breaking down boundaries. And so the boundary work concept, underpinned by this relational perspective, emphasizes the human relationships in citizen science, and in the case of decision making, uh, emphasizes the social processes and practices that both enable and constrain this potential. So Waterwatch um, was the, uh, the, the case study that I, that I used to examine the role of boundary work in citizen science. It's one of the oldest programs, citizen science programs in Australia, uh, but there's been very little systematic research uh, over the course of its duration. And the program has a really rich history, but I, I can't go into that uh, given today's time constraints. But in the context of this research, uh, there are a few important points to highlight. First is that it's state-sponsored, meaning that it's funded by government agencies, and it's this relationship with government that has really shaped its core goals and objectives, which include both engaging the public in waterway issues, um, as well as contributing data to inform waterway management and policy. The program's undergone significant developments over the course of its history too, uh, really trying to improve the credibility of the data it's collecting uh, by conducting quality assurance and quality control procedures, but also creating new technologies to support uh, data collection and management. And finally, the program operates in different states and regions, uh, and because of this, it's a really flexible model that can adapt to different social and environmental contexts. And this enables the programs, uh, as they're developed in different regions, to be targeted addressing specific issues that are, uh, that are affecting specific places. So the case studies that I looked at were one in Victoria and one in ACT. They were similar in size and they were um, initiated back in the early 90s. Uh, the differences are that they operate in different environmental contexts, Victoria in an urban environment and the ACT mostly in a rural environment. Uh, the second difference was their, their objectives. Um, the Victorian case study was really geared towards capacity building and awareness raising, uh, whereas the ACT program was more about uh, providing a general catchment picture uh, based on citizen science data for the region, as well as uh, awareness raising. So a key question in the research was how scientists, waterway managers and policymakers view citizen science as, as a useful source of environmental information. And the analysis of these uh, insights uh, revealed that across both case studies, uh, water watchers face clear opposition and resistance from some scientists and decision makers. I heard that Water Watch was not perceived to be credible uh, and that it had been historically sidelined from decision making. I heard that Water Watch uh, was not perceived to be relevant, that, it's not, that, that, that it does not collect the scientific data that is of interest to professionals, like here, uh, E. coli, uh, heavy metals uh, or nutrients. And finally, I heard that Water Watch was not considered to be a legitimate scientific program and that it was better placed as a community engagement tool and not a data generating program. And what I find, what I found most striking throughout my PhD was that Waterwatch has been up against similar negative perceptions for many, many years. This article here by wetland ecologist Max Finlayson highlighted that when considering Waterwatch as a mechanism to improve wetland management, the program would have to grapple with great skepticism and overt opposition um, from some researchers and government officials. And this is an enduring challenge that has left Waterwatch continually trying to justify its value in the face of this exclusionary form of boundary work that's casting citizen science as a lesser form of environmental knowledge when compared with professional approaches. And so a key question in this research as well was, well, what are the impacts of these, these perceptions? And the insights from coordinators across both case studies highlighted some of these. Uh, on the one hand, I interviewed one coordinator who reported the program as an edge case, and that it was only for education uh, that you engage the services of Waterwatch. Um, and then the, the same coordinator also suggested that Water Watch data and professional data were kept very, very separate, which highlights again this clear distinction being made between citizen science and decision making. And on the other hand, a coordinator from the ACT suggested that the program for much of its history was a fringe thing existing on the periphery of waterway governments and highlighted examples where you know, she was regularly excluded from being part of the decision making process. So the second part of this presentation is to show how both case studies have been working to maximise their usefulness and impact in decision making by performing different types of boundary work. And I've got three types here. First is aligning boundaries, 
the second is reconfiguring boundaries, and the third is creating boundaries. So when it comes to aligning boundaries, these are the practices, objects, and sustained patterns of interaction between groups and organizations as they pursue collective goals. <clears throat> this uh, form of boundary work was only discovered uh, in the ACT program, and there were two types. First was the use of boundary spans, and these are individuals who occupy a really central position between two knowledge domains, in this case between water watch and policy making. And for many years, our boundary spanners have been highlighted as a critical factor enabling scientific information to effectively inform policy. But its role in citizen science has been largely unexplored. And so this quote here by the individual who was a self-proclaimed boundary spanner suggested that his role was finding ways to maximise the value of the program for both governments, but also for communities and the Water Watch program. The second type of uh, boundary work that enabled boundaries to be aligned was by the through the use of boundary objects and these are artifacts like reports, databases and maps and they exist between these two knowledge domains by facilitating communication between them. And so this example here is the CHIP report which is uh, provides not only a general catchment picture for catchment managers for that data to be used in decision making but it also provides a summary reporting for volunteers based on its reach based approach so individual sites. And so the second form of boundary work here uh, I found in the Melbourne, uh, the Victorian case study were the uh, efforts by actors to manipulate or arrange boundaries to, to bring them into new configurations. So in the Victorian case, coordinators were mainly focused on this type of boundary work, which was all about trying to shift narratives about the value of the program. And they achieved this through bringing uh, through short term manageable projects with clear aims and outcomes. And one example uh, is a project where the Water Watch facilitator um, helped to develop connections between volunteers and waterway managers uh, to monitor oxygen levels in drying up pools along uh, a river in Melbourne uh, that was uh, a refuge for the threatened Yarra Pygmy perch. And the monitoring has since informed uh, environmental watering uh, by the water, the water Authority when oxygen levels uh, were below a critical point. And so these temporary and targeted projects provided a way to bypass the internal constraints that had historically limited the uptake of the program at higher levels of decision making. And this coordinator describes that such projects have had the potential to change the narrative about the value of Water Watch in decision making. And the final example here is around creating boundaries, these, these, these efforts to extend or construct boundaries to maximize the social position of the program, improve access to resources, as well as enable uh, increased legitimacy of the program. So these involve, uh, so the examples here were around creating new connections or bridging boundaries with uh, more powerful organizations with the aims of building the influence of Water Watch. So in the ACT case, the, the program facilitator connected with a local university to examine the accuracy of Water Watch data when compared to a professional data set. And the report actually demonstrated equivalency between these two data sets among other scientific benefits and this was assessed by some people I spoke to as being really fundamental in securing additional funding and changing the perspectives of decision makers around the value of the program. The second type here is around separating science from education. And this was done to enable collaboration with decision makers. As this coordinator suggested uh, from this quote here, you've got to be really careful that your education goals are not muddled with your data goals because you do them both a disservice if they are. So separating is science and education as a form of boundary work. So to conclude, I want to reiterate that successful linkages between citizen science and decision making are important because they reflect uh, the increasing acceptance of citizen science as a legitimate form of environmental knowledge. However, when we're working to make these connections, we must not think about this in a linear way. That is, citizen science information is generated and it's transferred into the policy making arena. Instead, we need to think of um, this issue around the uptake of citizen science in decision making uh, as a relational process and that programs must integrate these factors into the, their development and planning. And so this research has shown various ways, various social practices and strategies that have enabled uh, greater uptake of, of citizen science data and decision making. Uh, and finally, I just want to conclude by leaving you with this final quote from an interview I conducted with a scientist from the ACT case. When asked about whether the situation was changing for Water Watch, he said that it was, it was changing one retirement at a time, 
it was a changing of the guards. So thank you.